Hey guys, I'm Heidi Preeb. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if this is your first time here. On this channel, we talk a lot about how to get more of what we want out of our lives and less of what we don't want. And in this video, I wanna talk about a particular phenomenon, which is the feeling of being unable to let go of a relationship that in reality has probably already ended. So this question comes in a lot of different forms. How do I let go? How do I move on? How do I get over my ex or someone else who's been significant to me? And the way that I tend to translate this question in a lot of those cases is into the sentence, how do I let go of my attachment to somebody? Because in a lot of cases, when this question is getting asked, it's getting asked by somebody who has already, in reality, effectively ended their relationship with the person in question, or who's pretty clear on the fact that that is the move they want or that they think would be the best to make. So in this video, we're gonna talk about how it feels to be securely attached and to move on from relationships and why it's so different for those who are more insecure or who have some sort of developmental or relational wounding that comes online that might cause feelings of attachment to persist even in situations where what you really want is to move on from that attachment and find yourself in a new phase. So the fundamental question here for me is how are some people so able to move past relationships while others are not. So how do people who are securely attached, let's say, manage to stay friends with ex-partners even after attachment wounds have happened? How do people stop ruminating and holding on to what was once good while other people stay really stuck in these patterns of anger and sadness and blame when a relationship ends? And the first step of kind of understanding this is that when a secure person moves on from let's say a romantic relationship or some other form of attachment relationship, what they're moving on from is the attachment itself. So that idea of who that person is going to be in their life and what role they're going to play in their lives. And when they're able to kind of take people out of that category in their minds, out of the category of attachment figure, it's pretty easy and natural to let the relationship transition into whatever makes them most sense. So for secure people, if something didn't work out romantically, maybe after some time, there's still room in your life for a friend and that person could fill that role or an acquaintance or whatever it is. Attachment figures are people who we go to for co-regulation, so for consistent mirroring, as well as to an extent to have our needs for comfort, safety, and support met. When someone is secure, if they notice that those needs are no longer getting met through an attachment relationship, provided they're an adult at this point, generally those feelings of attachment start to naturally fade. Of course, this might happen after they have first tried to revive the relationship a few times, and it might be a process that involves a lot of pain and grief, but their feelings change as a reflection of the reality that they are being faced with. Now, in contrast to this, if you have an insecure attachment system, Often what happens if your needs are not getting met in reality, you might start naturally without even noticing this is happening, slip into a fantasy world where your needs are getting met through your relationship, if not at this point in time, maybe some point in the future, so you're imagining a year down the road or five years down the road when things are going to be different, and you start co-regulating with that fantasy instead of with reality. And this is often how we end up in these sticky situations where the relationship we have in reality is a mess, but we still feel deeply attached to it. Because what's actually happening is that we've gotten really attached to the fantasy we have about things turning around, or about our partner changing and becoming different, or maybe about ourselves changing and becoming different and winning back the perfect relationship which usually never existed in reality, because even the most secure relationships are very far from perfect. But in order to happily co-regulate with that fantasy, we need the other person to be in our lives or else the fantasy starts feeling really unrealistic. So in this video, most of what we're gonna talk about is how to recenter into reality Notice what's actually happening in your life and in your relationships and how to make sure that you are staying in that place of reality rather than slipping away into a fantasy where the internal representation of someone that you have in your mind is in fact quite different from the reality of the relationship that you have with them. Because that's the only real answer when it comes to how to get over someone or how to move on from them or how to let go of your attachment to them. You need to engage with reality and notice what is actually there between you 
versus what is already gone or maybe what was never actually there in the first place. So because I am myself, you know that I had to make this a five step process. Step number one in the process is separating out your attachment to this person in reality from the story that you have about your attachment to this person that you use to regulate yourself. Chances are if you have this conscious drive and intention to become less attached to this person, it's because some part of you knows that in reality things are not working out. But maybe you have this story in your head of how you could turn things around or how the relationship is going to get a lot better in the next two to five years or about how if you leave you are never going to be able to get over them or you're never going to be able to find someone else, whatever it is, you might have all of these stories swirling around you that convince you to just stay where you are, even though where you are might be somewhere where you're really unhappy and things are not working out for you. And so step one is to, as much as humanly possible, notice when you're in a story. Notice what you're feeling when you're actually sitting across from this person, when you're actually spending time with them, versus how you feel when you're alone panicking at the thought of losing them. Whatever you're picturing when you picture losing them is a story. You don't know what it's going to feel like or what's going to be happening in your life when you lose them until you get there. You also couldn't possibly know what the future could hold with this person until you get there. The only real information you have about your connection to another person is the way that you feel when you are around them and associated to reality in their presence in real time. So step one is becoming increasingly aware of that. How do I feel around this person when I am with them? And there can be kind of tricky things that come up here, right? Maybe you feel phenomenal around this person half of the time, but the other half of the time you feel really neglected and you feel kind of put down or rejected by this person. That's also information, right? I feel inconsistently good around this person is a very different sentence than I feel good around them. Because when a very high level of inconsistency is present, it usually means that even the good times come along with an undercurrent of anxiety or even intense relief, which again is just worth noting. Now, when we grow up insecurely attached, we can't really just tell our brains to stop making stories about things. Our brains have learned to regulate with stories about hopes for the future for as long as we have been alive. But what we can do is become as conscious as possible about when we are in story versus when we are actually sitting in front of the person and noticing the difference between those two things. If most of the time that I feel happy in my relationship is actually when the person isn't around me and when I'm fantasizing about how different things could be later or how good things were at the beginning, that's a really key indication that something might be amiss with the relationship we have in reality. Versus if most of the time I feel really good around this person in reality and I don't find it difficult to stay associated and on the same page as them when we're together, that's probably a pretty good sign that the attachment is reasonably healthy. But I'm guessing if that's the case, you probably didn't click on this video. So let's move on to step number two. Step number two to letting go of your attachment to someone is to stop trying to control the outcome. Instead, start telling the truth in a self-responsible way inside of your relationship and just notice what happens in your relationship as a natural consequence of that. So this is the art of letting your life auto-correct around the truth. So I want to be clear here, the truth is not a story that you have around the other person. It's not you are manipulative and a liar right? The truth is something like, ooh, I felt a bit of anxiety coming up in my body when you made that promise to me. I have these memories coming up of times you made similar promises in the past and how it felt when they weren't followed through on. And so I'm noticing in this moment, I'm having a sense of anxiety and kind of discontent, like I don't know where to put my feelings down in a place where I can trust that they'll be safe. Maybe telling the truth is, I don't feel close to you and I don't know why and I really want to and I feel some sadness about the kind of distance that it feels like is present for me in our connection. Or I felt a lot of anger over the way that you spoke to me the last time we were together. And I noticed that standing here in front of you now, that anger's still pretty active and alive in me. And it's making it difficult for me to feel connected to you. When we start telling the truth in our connections, which is not easy work, right? This is a high level secure attachment skill. But the more we can do it, the more we naturally start to bump into the limitations and boundaries of our connections. 
If we are never testing to see what the other person would do in response to us sharing what's true for us, it's really easy to just dissociate into a fantasy where they always say and do the right thing. But if we start actually reality testing that, and showing up as the people we actually are with the feelings and thoughts that we actually have inside of our relationships, then we start to very quickly get the picture of what happens when we bring those things in. Maybe we share a difficult feeling and the other person instinctively kind of dissociates or zones out. Maybe we share something about our anger or our vulnerability and they come back immediately with a defensive insult to our character. Maybe we show something very raw and very vulnerable about ourselves to someone else and we get rejected. And the natural kind of protest that a lot of us have at this point, thinking about behaving this way in our relationships, is wait, but I'm gonna get hurt, right? That's gonna be so painful if I'm showing people my honest feelings, not knowing how they're gonna respond to them, especially in a relationship that already feels like it's falling apart. And unfortunately, the authentic response to that is yes. It is highly likely that it's going to hurt immensely to start showing up honestly inside of a relationship that has already fallen ill in some capacity. Hitting the realistic limits of a relationship that we have already formed an attachment to is extraordinarily painful. Breaking an attachment is extraordinarily painful. So I'm not here to tell you how to go through this process without experiencing pain, because it's not possible to do that. The pain of a broken attachment is the very thing that allows you to recognize on an emotional level that it's not working and allows you to finally move on from it. So I think that a good 90 plus percent of the time when people are really stuck on how do I move on, how do I let go, how do I let an attachment become a part of my past, the question they're actually asking is how do I do that without experiencing deep pain? And the answer is you cannot do that without experiencing deep pain. To show up to our lives as they actually are in reality at a point in time where what's happening in reality is that some sort of loving attachment relationship we have created is ending is if our emotional systems are working anywhere close to the way that they should be one of the most painful experiences we can go through. So again, this video is about how to go through it. It's not about how to bypass it and get to a point where our lives are different without us having to have felt the pain. If you are noticing what is happening, rather than running away with your stories about how you can change things or about how this doesn't matter and you don't have to feel sad because you're so much better than them and you're only just realizing it now, if you can stay in reality and notice the loss as it's happening, you are giving yourself the best chance possible at actually starting to move on from that thing in a healthy way. Which brings us to step number three. Step three is feel the pain of disconnection and loss without savioring yourself from that pain. So there are a lot of things that most of us do when we start to realize, ooh, this relationship or this thing that I want in my life is slipping through my fingers. We might create an angry story about how we don't care right? We might decide that that person was never any good and that actually we're so much better than them and we're so much better off without them and we don't need them anyway. And what does that angry story allow us to do? It allows us to temporarily disconnect, but it's not entirely based in reality. If you loved this person enough to form a connection with them in real life, it's highly likely that they are not all bad. And the moment you remember the moment that kind of anger leaves your system just enough for those memories of the good parts to creep back in, it's gonna be really easy to go immediately back. Because usually what we're doing when we're telling ourselves an angry story about someone is just keeping ourselves connected to them in a different way. Saviouring ourselves from the pain might look like going immediately into a different relationship and telling ourselves this person is nothing like the last person. They're way better and so now I'm completely happy. And once again, the moment that starts to crumble and we start to see the ways in which this new person is actually far inferior to co-regulating with us in certain ways that our ex-partner was, 
once again, it's going to start looking really attractive to go back into that old connection, either in reality or inside of our own minds. Anything we are doing, whether that means moving on with another person, whether that means turning to drugs and alcohol and partying for six months after a relationship ends, whether that means throwing ourselves into work and trying to forget about it, whether that means telling ourselves angry, victimized stories about the other person, whether that means getting obsessed with some sort of revenge plot to get back at them, Anything we are doing to disconnect from the direct experience of emotional pain that we feel at an attachment ending is a way of keeping our fake attachment going. And what we're trying to do here is sync up our real and our internal representation of our attachment. So if it's over in reality, we want to find a way to sit and be present with the pain of it being over in reality. The moments when we miss them, we want to stay present for and really notice that feeling of them being absent from our lives. Notice what it feels like in your body when you hit one of those moments. Sometimes I just say out loud the physical sensations that are present for me to make them feel more real. For myself, sadness almost feels like this sense of water rushing downwards and out through my body. Like all of the energy in me is suddenly subject to an extreme gravitational pull downwards. But for everyone, it's different. If you can stay curious inside of those moments when they arise for you, when you're feeling that sense of loss, of pain, of grief, of disconnection, what you're doing in those moments is now syncing up your real relationship and your fantasy relationship. If the real relationship is ending, if your ability to truly make each other happy and co-regulate and protect each other throughout life and build a future together is no longer present, it's going to feel painful. And you're going to need to notice and give credit to those moments of pain when they arise. And they will arise frequently. And what the mind and the body is going to want to do is to jump to anything to get rid of those feelings. And this can include a sad, tragic, victimized story that makes the pain worse. So you have to watch out for that as well. Because if you can convince yourself that the pain is so big and so humongous and so overwhelming that you need them to come back because you couldn't possibly deal with this pain, now you're right back in that fantasy attachment world. My favorite mantra to do in really emotionally difficult moments is, I'm feeling X, Y, or Z. Here's what I notice is happening in my body and I'm surviving it. And that part is really important. I'm experiencing a moment of grief. I feel like the life is getting drained out of my body and there's not enough energy left in me to lift a single finger. And I'm surviving. This is how, as adults, we slowly train ourselves to deal with the existential pains that we weren't able to cope with as children and that we didn't have adequate comfort or protection around. So instead, we developed insecure attachment patterns and or elaborate distraction techniques and fantasy worlds. So this is the process of getting back in touch with our direct, real-time experience of being alive. Noticing and welcoming in the pain because the pain is the thing that is aligning us to reality. And that alignment with reality is going to be the thing that eventually allows us to properly let go of a relationship that's no longer working and move on. It's kind of like how food goes sour, right? It's a good thing to be able to smell the foul odor coming out of your food when it's gone bad because it protects you from continuing to eat it. So if you're plugging your nose every time you go to eat a meal, you might not notice when the food that you have is spoiled. And then you're going to be continuously making yourself sick without understanding why. And the same is true when we cover up reality with a fantasy. We might end up continuously engaging in the same situations that are making us sick without having an awareness of why. Emotional pain is like the foul scent rising up from the cheese that you've left in the fridge for too long. It's not pleasant to experience it, but it's there to tell you something about how to stop accidentally poisoning yourself. One of the simplest but most profound sentences you can learn to repeat to yourself when you find yourself moving through this process is, I am in pain, and the reason I'm in pain is because this relationship is not working. It centers you in the reality of what is happening, it acknowledges the truth of your experience, and it prevents you from going into this fantasy world. I am in pain, and I am in pain because I am losing something I care about and that I once loved deeply. Whatever it is that resonates for you, find that sentence that aligns you to reality 
in those moments of pain and don't allow your mind to savor you from that pain by disconnecting from it and going into some fantasy or story. Stay as present as you possibly can. It's terrible in the short term and in the long term, it pays off immensely. Which leads us to step number four. If you've gotten to this point in the process where you're looking at reality and recognizing what isn't working, and maybe you've even let this relationship go already in reality, now your job is to just allow your life to have a void in it for a while. You cannot move on from anything that you have once loved and considered a part of yourself without moving through the void of that thing's absence. Otherwise, all you're gonna be doing is trying to recreate the past in the present. And some people do spend their entire lives doing this, right? A relationship ends and you go, that's fine. I can just go immediately into the next one and get everything that I need from that one. And then one day, six months from now, you wake up and look at your partner and inside of your mind, hate them for all of the ways in which they're not your past partner. Yeah. They're not. The point of the void was to absorb and help you integrate all of the parts of the person you once loved that you want to carry forward with you as a part of yourself. And in order to get to that place where you're able to integrate that, you have to first let the void alert you to the ways in which you really miss that person and the ways in which their absence has a really strong impact on your life. It hurts in the void. It's not fun to be there. So don't expect this to feel good, right? Just expect it to be deeply useful and growing in the long term. So I remember there was a point in my life where there was someone who was deeply important to me who had recently left my life. And a big part of the way in which that person had been important to me was that they had served as a very strong feminine force in my life. They were very nurturing and they sat with me in a lot of my sadness and they helped me see kind of the softer, more beautiful side of the world when I was coming at it from a harsher place. And they helped me nurture a lot of the feminine qualities in myself that I neglected for the majority of my life. And I remember one day after they'd left my life, walking past a department store and getting hit with this intense scent of perfume. And I got so viscerally sad in like an instant. And I remember later that week talking to my therapist about it and telling him, I just feel like anytime I see something kind of beautiful and feminine and soft, I just miss this person and that presence that they had in my life so badly. And he went, okay, so you haven't yet integrated the thing that they were giving you. Because what that person gave you wasn't just the direct influence that they had, they showed you something about what you could allow into your life. So in my case, for a long time, I had been shutting out my relationship to the feminine and the feminine qualities that existed inside of me. And around this person, I gave myself permission for those things to matter and be valuable. And I could still give myself that same permission now that they were gone. I was just going to have to learn to integrate their impact and start embodying it instead of seeing that experience as intrinsically connected to that person. And when it comes down to it, that's a lot of what love is, right? It's the feeling of learning things through another person, of being exposed to new ways of understanding the world and ourselves and other people. And in a lot of ways, our identities do kind of merge with other people. Now, this can happen to a wildly unhealthy extent, of course, but in secure relationships, that is somewhat normal. There is this process of I take on elements of you and you take on elements of me, and we construct this kind of shared identity of the way that we understand the world through each other's eyes. And when our attachment to a person ends, when their literal role in our life comes to a close, then it's up to us to figure out what parts of that shared reality that existed between us do I want to reintegrate and allow to become a pervasive part of my identity without always having to think of it as a direct reflection of that other. Of course, there's always gonna be highly specific things that remind us of other people. But for the most part, when we have integrated a loss, what it means is that we have picked up all the pieces of what that person brought into our life and we've chosen which ones we wanna leave behind behind versus which ones we want to allow to become a permanent part of us. And so spending time in that void with our eyes open means conceding to the fact that for a while we are going to be painfully aware of this person's absence and 
our life can go on in the process. We can go to work feeling a little bit sad and noticing the points when we'd like to be able to reach out and text them or tell them a joke that only they would understand. We can go to social engagements and feel a little bit sad and resigned and like we don't really want to get to know anyone else. We can cook meals for ourselves feeling sad. We can fall asleep at night hugging a body pillow that we wish were someone else and we can trust in the process that this experience of moving through that void of someone's absence and noticing and staying associated to it can and will absorb the loss. You get to decide inside of the void what you keep with you as you move forward in life and what you leave behind. And that is an incredibly powerful position for you to be in. But the only way to get there is for us to actually stay present with the pain. If we dissociate from it, if we try to savior ourselves from it, if we try to fall in love with someone else to get it to go away, we are robbing ourselves of this immense, incredible growth opportunity. Moving through the void changes you on a fundamental level. And you will know that you are on the other side of the void when you feel changed. When you don't feel like you need to go back to that other person or that past connection, either in reality or inside of your own mind, in order to get the wonderful benefit of having had it. If you met that person at a point in your life when you were extremely depressed and they made you feel really happy, you will know that you have moved through the void of their absence when you have felt the pain of that loss and integrated the fact that you need a life full of joy and laughter. So you've gone out and found it in other places. And now thinking back on that person, you don't need them back in your life in order to feel that sense of joy and vitality. You found a way to integrate that need and get it filled in another way. Maybe there is a structure that that person added to your life or a sense of responsibility that you find it difficult to hold on your own. You'll know that you've moved through that void when you get to the other side of it and recognize that actually you've gotten pretty good at managing your own life and staying responsible. So thinking back to that past person, you might have fond memories of them, but you no longer need them to come in and help you organize yourself. You've integrated that. Maybe there is something really comforting and soothing about this person. And you'll know that you're on the other side of that void when you finally learned how to comfort and soothe yourself or how to design a life where your grief and your pain is more readily absorbed through community and through self-care. So you don't need any one person to be the only one who sees your pain and helps you work through it. You'll know that you have arrived on the other side of the void when you look at your life and know without a shadow of a doubt that you are a different person than you were when you met that person who you got so attached to. That while you may still value them immensely as a human being and hope for the best for them, you no longer need them to fill the attachment role in your life because you've integrated the parts of that relationship that were once invaluable to you and you're now able to show up for yourself in that way. So there's no risk of backsliding. But this period where the loss feels so raw and so clear and so confronting in a lot of ways is a necessary component of recognizing what needs to get integrated in order for you to move on. This is the period of just living inside of the reality of loss, which can include really beautiful moments. I would say some of the most profound and exquisite moments of my entire life have happened inside of periods of deep loss. Because if you let it, loss really wakes you up to the present moment. It makes you hyper aware of what you have that you usually take for granted. So living in the void is this experience of deep pain, but it's also potentially this experience of deep gratitude and deep growth and deep connection with other people. Trying to speed our way out of the void means to rob ourselves of some of the most human moments of our lives. Because again, this is our chance to prove to ourselves, I am now old enough and wise enough and capable enough to cope with the losses that my childhood self could not cope with. And if you can truly teach yourself to do this well, you will gain an immeasurable amount of self-trust. Which leads us to the fifth and final step, which we've already kind of covered in step number four. Integrate the love and the care and the connection that you had with this other 
until you become this kind of beautiful mosaic of yourself and your past relationships. And let that be the new version of you going forward. So I remember reading the book, I believe it was Upheaval by Jared Diamond, who is a very brilliant geographer and historian. And he was talking about why certain nations recover from crisis points and others do not. And he was using the nation of Japan as an example of a culture that had at one point in history done a really beautiful job of assimilating its traditional cultural values with new ones that had come into play during a crisis point. And he describes Japan as this beautiful mosaic of what has been as well as what is. And that struck me as such a beautiful metaphor for moving through any period of personal loss or change. It's not how do I get rid of the old completely? And it's also not how do I hold desperately onto it without letting anything change? It's how do I use what I took from the past and weave it through the present in order to arrive at a period of my life where the past and the present are now this beautiful new tapestry that looks and will always look different than what it was. And this wove so beautifully in for me to this lecture that I remember attending when I was doing my master's degree in attachment theory where we were watching this video of Patricia Crittenden who is the founder of the dynamic maturational model of attachment talking about how it takes an average of three years to really move on from someone who's been a deep significant attachment figure to us. So this might be a parent, someone we were married to or had a very intertwined long-term relationship with. But what I really loved about what she was saying was that she defined what it means to move on from someone. She said three years is approximately, and this doesn't mean it's this way for everyone, but this is the average, the period of time that it takes to move from a place where our identity and the way that we think about ourselves is significantly intertwined with this other to a place where our identity feels like it is all ours again. And regardless of what period of time this takes for a given person, I think that it's beautiful to have that as a reference point for what it means to move on and let go of an attachment to somebody. How much of me do I feel like still belongs to this other? And for some of us, we can stay stuck for the entirety of our lives in that place, right? We can be 75 years old thinking about someone we knew in our 20s and still feeling like a part of ourselves was left behind in that relationship. But it's never too late to reclaim those things. Decide that if they've stuck with us for that long, there must be something that we need from that and learn to embody and integrate it into our personal identity so it no longer feels tied to that other. And when we have hit that point, when we have let go of our fantasy relationship with this other people being the place where we go to have all of these needs met, our needs for love, care, self-esteem, sexual attraction, nurturing, whatever it is, it could truly be anything. And we learn to be present enough with the loss to figure out which parts of that loss we want to take with us and integrate into our understanding of ourselves to create that new tapestry. That's how we know that we are finally doing that work of deeply moving on and healing from a past attachment. All right, that's all I have to say for today on this topic. As always, let me know what's coming up for you guys in the comments as you go through this video. I love you guys. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and each other and your inner children. And I will see you back here again really soon.